Watch and follow and say one o'clock. Good afternoon, every, everyone. We'll begin our CPS Energy Board of Trustees meeting to be held on June 27, 2022, at 1 p.m. Watch say 1 p.m. Okay, at uh, this time, uh, Ms. Ramirez, would you please confirm the quorum? Yes, sir. We have Vice Chair Gonzalez, Trustee Steen, Trustee Romero, and yourself, sir. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you. At this time, we have uh, confirmed the quorum. We have safety message. Invocations by Mr. Kevin Polo and Pledge of Allegiance. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, we'll start with the evacuation procedures. Uh, we first wanted to review the evacuation procedures so that we are prepared to be safe in the event of an emergency. Uh, if you'd hear the fire alarm, follow, follow the instructions announced through the public address system. If asked to evacuate, use the glass door exiting out of the boardroom to the outside. If that door is blocked, use the back door. Verbally alert others in the room and evacuate. Uh, we'll move to the main parking lot in front of the building or the at and parking lot over the McCullough Brooklyn Street bridges. In the event of a situation like this, our security team will be monitoring the situation and will notify the appropriate emergency services and team members. Uh, we will also have employees nearby who are trained to administer first aid if needed. Uh, safety is a top priority at CPS Energy. And while we hope this information is never needed, we want to be sure we are ready uh, and always ready if needed. Uh, will you please stand with me for the invocation? We are thankful for this day that you have given us, for its blessings, its opportunities, its challenges. Thank you for the ability to be involved in useful work and for the honor of bearing important responsibilities. We ask that you would guide our thoughts and our actions so that we may have a successful meeting of the CPS Energy Board of Trustees. Help us to accomplish our goals while displaying your character. Help us to do good, to be honest, to serve others, and to fulfill our obligations to our community. We pray these things in your name. Amen. And now please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, we'll have public comments. Good afternoon. Public comment provides an opportunity for members of the public to share thoughts on any of this meeting's posted agenda items. We'll invite pre-registered speakers to speak, and they may only address the board on CPS Energy-related business listed on the posted agenda. Speakers should state their first and last name, the organization or group they represent, and the agenda item they are going to speak about. For this meeting, we have three speakers. Each speaker will have two minutes to speak, Thomas, will you please cue the timer? Our first speaker is Dr. Meredith McGuire, followed by Christopher Mayorga. Hello, I'm Dr. Meredith McGuire of the local Sierra Club. Um, I've read the report of the Rocky Mountain Institute about CPS energy producti production projection process and analysis. And um, for the top utility, CPS processes are seriously flawed. In my opinion, one of the worst flaws is the extent to which CPS misrepresented those results in its own, to its own board members. Be sure to read the report uh, and see if you disagree with my evaluation. Uh, my handout covers several of the misrepresentations that I have observed in the last three years. So you should have uh, a handout sort of like this. Um, but first, I'd like to make my closing recommendation. I think it's really important for um, 
CPS to change the rates and ask more of the users of the most uh, energy. And in particular, I'm talking about those with the um, C, excuse me, SLP rate structure. Uh, it's very important for those uh, businesses that are making huge amounts of money, they're using huge amounts of electricity, and what's really important is to find a way that they can contribute not just with the rates themselves, but more importantly with them in co-investing in improving the grid of this city. If those businesses were to be required to, in order to keep a, a lower rate for them, you could require them to have um, buy in to uh, on site uh, solar and also uh, on, uh, and the on site storage. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it's up. Well, I would just like to say to you all please do look carefully at what's being said under between the lines because we want to see. CPS change big time and start talking about the truth and who really should be uh, paying. So please, and I'd be happy to talk to any of you if you would like to get in touch with me. Thank you. At, oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your input. Our next speaker is Christopher Mayorga, followed by Antonia Taylor. Good afternoon, I'm Christopher Mayorga with Rewiring America. I am also addressing generation planning. I am grateful for the progress that CPS is making in terms of sustainability and renewable energy. And I have also recently read the report by the Rocky Mountain Institute that was referred to earlier. And it showed me that generation planning needs to go further uh, if we as a city want to meet our climate goals. The report points out how the CPS has made some mistakes in the past uh, in regards to misleading communication on customer affordability, uh, overly narrow scenarios and modeling, suboptimal analysis of the clean energy market data and natural gas price forecasts, inadequate financial considerations for coal retirement, and limited discussions of the impacts of climate change related risks on future operations. I also highly recommend that you read the report and something that uh, I can add is that I've spoken to several council members about the possibility of shutting down Spruce and something that constantly comes up is concern about rates increasing, which is something that I share also. I don't want rates to increase for, our, for residents and ratepayers like me. But also I think that the report points out how we've been misinformed about the impacts of shutting down spruce. The costs of solar, wind, and batteries continue to decrease, and the price of natural gas, which uh, it's proposed to convert spruce to natural gas, continues to increase while climate change is continuing to worsen. So methane is the main component of natural gas, and scientists are telling us that we are seeing an increase in methane emissions when we should be seeing a decrease. So I would, I'm also hope and open to meeting about this topic, and I really hope to see some progress on renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Our next speaker is Antonia Taylor. Last call for Antonia Taylor. That was our last registered speaker. I will now turn the meeting back to Chair Dr. Mackey. Thank you. Okay, we'll move to item number three, uh, number four, uh, Chair's remark. I would like to thank the employees of uh, CPS Energy for doing a wonderful job during the, this month of uh, June. It's been extremely hot throughout the month of June, and our lights are still on, electric still flowing, because the staff here at CPS is doing a wonderful job. So I'd like to thank them for the job that they're doing because this is one of these months that we haven't had in many, many years. And their CPS energy 
is doing an extremely great job in keeping electric on. So thank you all very much for the job. This time I'd like to move to item number four, the chair's remark. I mean the uh, item five, interim CEO's report. All right. Well, I've got a fairly um, brief report uh, that I'll run through, and then we're going to turn it over to Lisa for this month's focus, uh, which really is on the investments that we talked to council about during the rate uh, request on uh, the various aspects of our business that our rate request supported. So today, Lisa's going to be covering uh, that aspect of it. Uh, go on to the next slide, please. So I'm going to start because this is a new way we have tried to start communicating in light of the feedback we received from uh, the uh, Committee on Emergency Preparedness. One of the things that we heard from council members was the way we're communicating the public needs to be more direct, needs to be more action oriented. Uh, and as ERCOT has gone through uh, upgrading the way they communicate, you know, their uh, situational, you know, uh, considerations to the state, we really needed to follow suit and come up with a new way of, of letting the community know where we're at on any given day. Uh, as Chair Dr. Mackey just mentioned, we have already seen 21 days over 100 degrees, 21 days. Uh, and by and large, um, you know, the, the ERCOT market is paying, you know, for a lot of additional capacity than maybe we've ever done before in light of Winter Storm Uri. Uh, there's a cost uh, that everybody shares in that, but uh, by and large, we've seen the ERCOT market anywhere from, you know, four to 6,000 megawatts long, you know, uh, during some, some really tight, you know, uh, 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 high temperature days. Uh, and so uh, the calls for conservation will continue. Uh, you know, I looked earlier today, I believe today is a green day. Uh, but on days where we're going to ask customers con to conserve because we expect to hit a system peak, you'll see those, those, uh, you know, those days turn to yellow. And if something's going on at ERCOT that we need to communicate to our community, um, then we'll utilize the orange or, you know, unfortunately, if, in the event there's a, some type of rolling out of situation, you'd see us move to red. Uh, but what I can tell you is this is a, a work in progress. Uh, we've got to continue to educate our, our community on what these levels uh, mean, but I have gotten a lot of really positive feedback that at a minimum, uh, it's forcing uh, members of our community to pay attention to what's going on uh, when it's really hot, and we expect uh, that, uh, that the summer will continue along these lines. Last summer, we had a lot of rain, and we didn't have one, degree, one day over 100 degrees. This time, we've had no rain in 21 days over 100 degrees, and, and by and large, uh, our system has remained reliable. And uh, I'm really proud of, of the team for their efforts to make sure that uh, we're being responsive and, and that our plants are running and, and we're doing the things that we need to do to, you know, to take care of our community. So I want to start with conservation. Uh, I will invite uh, members of the board. Uh, I have communicated to our staff that uh, I want them to be comfortable as we, you know, make sure that we're keeping our building at an appropriate temperature to conserve as well. Uh, so I don't have a tie on. I've asked members of my team to take their ties off today. And I invite the uh, members of the board, uh, you know, in the months of July and August to ditch the ties and set a good example for our employees to be comfortable uh, when, uh, when we're turning the temperatures up around here. Next slide, please. One of the things that we have uh, communic been communicating to the board that we will continue to communicate uh, is material shortages. Supply chain issues are impacting the utility industry at a global level, uh, and certainly CPS Energy has not uh, been, you know, uh, escaped the impacts right now. The biggest impacts that we've seen really have to do with materials related to our gas supply. Uh, but uh, as you can see, between late deliveries uh, and stockouts, uh, we are paying, I get a report every week uh, that tells me, you know, uh, what, what is on the watch list, and, and by and large, our, our supply chain folks have been doing a fantastic job of managing it. We're working with our builders uh, in San Antonio to ensure that everybody's getting what they need as their projects are coming due. Uh, and so we have uh, done, really done probably better than most in the industry at managing these impacts. If you could go on to the next slide. These are the three um, components right now that we're paying a lot of attention to. Uh, tapping tees, you know, how we tap into our main to run services. Uh, the, uh, those risers we found 
uh, a new solution to gas risers to be able to set meters. Uh, and of course, gas regulators. Our, our team is actually taking old gas regulators, reconditioning them and repurposing them uh, to be able to reutilize those as we're uh, changing, uh, changing those regulators out. So we're doing what we can. I was at the gas uh, uh, facility last week when a truckload of these alternative gas risers came in and the look of relief on our gas team's face, I got to tell you, uh, was, pretty, uh, was pretty evident. And, uh, and again, it just highlights how supply chain challenges for us can impact the day-to-day -day responsibility that we have to serve our community. Uh, and certainly it has had an impact on uh, new customers that uh, are coming online on both the gas and electric side. Next slide, please. Coming back to our radio system project, uh, back when I was still uh, the leader over our distribution operations division, uh, we kicked off our participation with the city uh, and the county and the Alamo Area Regional Radio System Project. Uh, and we did that because we believe we could leverage our investment with the investment of our partners uh, in a, an improved radio system. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, today what, what we're going to be doing is commending uh, all the members of our team who have participated uh, in this. Uh, I don't believe Vivian Bouet is here, but she was my partner in this project uh, when we still kicked it off uh, many years ago. Uh, and I am happy to say that as of June 9th, uh, the R system is, is, is online. Um, there's Vivian, all right. The R system is online. Uh, and, um, w and what we have found is that, e that because of the pandemic, our, our vendor actually uh, uh, called a force majeure event uh, due to all the impacts on labor and materials and everything that were also impacting the radio system. And in spite of that, we were still able to bring that system in uh, about five and a half months behind schedule, but it could have been a year or two behind schedule. And uh, our partners across the R's uh, uh, system really worked together to, to, del to deliver that. And I will tell you, we delivered it at $350,000 under cost of what we thought uh, we were going to spend when we started this process. So uh, overall, I could not be prouder. Uh, I, I do think, move on to the next slide, please, Jessica. Uh, we do have a, a brief video to show you from Gilbert Brown, who's manager of service restoration. But, but before we play the video, I want to say this. When I took over the uh, operations side of the business, the, the primary complaint that I heard from our workforce was that the radio system was unsafe that there were pockets in our community where they could not either have cell phone service because coverage was bad, and as a result, the radio system uh, didn't work in those areas as well. And overall, I think you'll, what you'll hear from Gilbert is that those coverage issues have been addressed as a result of this radio system. Uh, and I just want to thank the team for their efforts, uh, and I want to thank the city and the county for being good partners. Uh, and as a community, we're a safer community uh, because of our investment uh, in this system. So, Jessica, if we could play the video. So, for my team, I, 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 uh, I help manage the service restoration department. Service restoration department is our first responders that go out to our emergencies that we have out there in all, all areas of our, of our viewing, all, all the areas that we have, our service areas. There, these gentlemen go out work by themselves. So, these radios that are now they have no dead spots. Uh, we've, we've tested them all over the place, in and out of uh, buildings and out in the rural areas. These gentlemen right here will go out there in confidence, knowing that they will be able to get a system operator whenever there's an emergency, and that'll help them get through the emergencies they have out there during storms, during uh, outages that we have. And this is very important, especially for, for our troublemen that work alone. That's, that's when it's very important to them. What do these new radios do that your old radios couldn't do? I think what this was is we have we these are, are they're durable not only that but they've been tested to go with sapd fire department the county and all them so we know that they're durable our older radios there was some spots there where there was dead spots there and they had to use their phones to do it these actually have been tested and now there's places where the phone doesn't work but these radios still work so they've done extensive testing throughout our whole viewing area our whole area that we have and we know that they work there Okay, I think what we're going to do is like we did with uh, our lineman rodeo team. We're going to ask our, uh, our members of the team to come up, take a quick picture with the board, uh, and I'll call you all up. Uh, for those of you who are in attendance, we've got uh, Richard Silva, Renee Garner. Renee was there with us from the get-go. I think that 
this project actually brought Renee to CPS Energy. Uh, Joe Duell, Sean Eschman, Eric Olson, is Dustin Maki here? I'm not sure Dustin's working. He's our manager over our, our system operations group. Uh, Gilbert, the star of the show. Come on up, Gilbert. Stacy Zimmerly, Ralph Flores, uh, Melissa Gutierrez, David Lenz. Is David here? I didn't see David. Uh, Lisa Pavoda. Lisa here? Mark Brumbaugh, Scott Lisi, Teresa Green, Teresa here? Uh, John Mason, all right. Andrew Sakula, Josh Dean, Josh should be here. Emily, uh, Emily Speed, Cynthia Reyna, Martha Garza, and Jean Drays. Is that everybody? Anybody else I didn't call that was part of the team? Come on up. All right. Come on up, guys. All right, can we get a round of applause for our RC? team? Very good. I want to thank you all for your outstanding job and work that you all are doing for CPS. Thank you all on behalf of the board. Thank you, all. Thank you. Okay. So last Saturday, uh, not this Saturday, but the Saturday before, we hosted our 23rd annual Kids Fish Day, and I want to recognize Benny Etheridge, Lisa Lewis, uh, Deanna Hardwick. Uh, we had an absolute fantastic day. There's a video that we'll send to the board uh, that captures uh, the day. But we had 40 children, uh, many of which have never been fishing before, uh, that, that may be challenged in, in whatever ways they're challenged. Uh, but we had over 150 volunteers uh, that made that day happen. Uh, the kids caught fish after fish after fish. Uh, our IBW Local 500 cooked uh, some burgers and some hot dogs for them. Uh, and overall, it was just one of the best days that I've had uh, in this role as CEO. So uh, every, every time uh, we put on an event of this nature, our, our team shows up. Uh, and um, the energy out there with these kids was just uh, heartwarming. So uh, we're going to put it on your schedules next uh, year. Uh, April 1st, 2023 uh, is our date for next year. Uh, and I just wanted to recognize the team uh, for their work on, on Kid Fish Day. It was an absolute fantastic event, and uh, it's something that the uh, Board of Trustees should be really proud of. Okay, we're going to move into our monthly performance update with Lisa. This is just a snapshot uh, of the elements of our uh, rate request uh, that Lisa is going to spend some time on today. Uh, really, when you think about the uh, investment that we spoke to council and this board about, with respect to the technology work that we need to do to upgrade our systems, the significant growth that we're seeing in our community, uh, our workforce challenges and the need uh, to fill those spots, and the resiliency work, the work that Benny and Richard and, and both Richards and, and Deanna need to do to ensure our systems are resilient. Uh, we're doing really, really well uh, overall, and we're, we're making good on the investments that we told the community were necessary uh, to ensure that we're keeping CPS Energy uh, reliable and able to provide service. So with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Ms. Lisa Lewis. Item number six. Yeah, I have some remarks. They're, they're sort of directed at, at Rudy Garza, but they, they concern the monthly performance updates. So should I do those now or should I do them after Lisa? After Lisa. That's the end, so I either need a new new deck. And by well, the deck comes up. 
while that's happening, um, just as a reminder, last month, Corey Kaczynski briefed you on financial metrics and focused on those. Uh, we're following a quarterly process. Each, each month, we're going to cover a quarter, but from a different perspective. Uh, so this month, I'll be highlighting some of the key metrics that, we, that Rudy just mentioned, and that, that review is in a quarterly rotation. So next month, you'll get a different set of metrics to look at and discuss. Remember that all of this is posted on cpsenergy.com after it is completed, um, and so after this report is completed, and so it will be available to the public as part of our uh, focus on transparency. Um, as I'm going to move on to the third slide in the presentation that says strategic objectives overview, and hopefully it'll catch up here with us momentarily. Um, as this framework came together, we focused on a handful of strategic objectives um, that would help us facilitate the two community conversations that Rudy referenced. You know, we've got, we've got two conversations going on around generation planning and rate design, and then a bunch of work that we need to deliver to our community as part of the commitments we made. We are doing this through the, the lens of equity, security, and it being enabled by technology and innovation, focusing on these five strategic objectives. And so um, that is the perspective that has framed our conversation for the key results. On slide five, the summary slide that Rudy showed you a minute ago, um, just be mindful that this reflects first quarter delivery of results. Uh, that means February through April 30th of this year. That's the conclusion of Q1. We're obviously continuing to track them, but we're going to report by quarter. As Rudy mentioned, those uh, objectives are tied to the things that we said we were going to deliver. The customer support, investing in our people, improving our resiliency, modernizing our technology, focusing on growth in our community. And so that's the perspective through which we're managing. Uh, on slide six, you'll see a deep dive into one of those metrics, retain and attract talent. Uh, this is a, a high level view of what we are measuring to ensure that we're doing what needs to be done to retain and attract our talent. We are measuring our commitment to fill the 250 frontline positions that we talked about, to put our dollars where we said we were going to by reinvesting them in our workforce and ensuring that we have the right match to the positions. Oh, perfect, thank you. The slide six, there we go. Um, and you know, like all companies, we are dealing with a, a higher level of turnover than we've ever experienced before. You can see on the slide in the notes updates box that we are seeing a 12% turnover. That for us is extreme. 6% um, would be normal. Primarily it is due to retirements, but there are certainly some ebbs and flows with workforce in general. Uh, we are on track with this metric uh, and to date are, are pretty satisfied with our performance. The next slide I'll highlight is the digital enterprise resource planning work. Uh, just as a reminder, our assessment phase has been completed. We are planning and developing the business case and the RFP for this work and our strategic roadmap for digital and data with a deadline of November of this year to bring that strategic roadmap to this group. And in uh, the next slide, slide eight, is um, a focus on expanding our services to meet the growth and demand that is happening right now in this community. We are on track with projected household growth and business growth. So the customer's growth as we projected it is pretty accurate. What we are also seeing is significant demands on infrastructure and that supply chain challenge that Rudy just briefed you on is a major challenge for us to keep our work moving forward. The commodity prices also are, are starting to become a concern and we are working with Corey's team. The, the supply chain team is working with Corey's team. We have not seen any signs of a slowdown yet in our market, so just something to be mindful of. We, we, it is plowing full steam ahead, and we continue to do that work. The rest of the metrics are in the appendix for your review and consideration. These are the three that probably presented the most significant uh, activity and focus. We are on track with all of them, and we will be back at the end of second quarter to give you a key metrics update again. And with that, I will be happy to answer any questions I can. Any questions or comments? Ms. Lewis or Mr. Garza? Mr. Thing. Uh, let me begin on the one hand by <clears throat> echoing Dr. Mackey and complimenting 
our interim CEO, Rudy Garza, uh, the onset of summer and the spring string of days where the temperature has exceeded 100 degrees have been challenging, to say the least, and you and your team have risen to the occasion. I know we are not out of the woods, but kudos to you all for keeping the electricity flowing without interruption thus far. On the other hand, let me reiterate my concerns over the way certain financial matters are being handled. In regard to bad debt from customer bills, we were told at the end of last year that the figure was $130 million, but then by January 31st, our fiscal year end, the figure had risen to $150 million. At our April 14th meeting, we were told the figure was close to $160 million. I believe today the, fi the, the figure hovers around $160 million. I understand that tens of thousands of customers roll off while tens of thousands roll on, but that the current bad debt represents about 20 percent of our customers and is trending up, not down. We have been told repeatedly there are two things that will mitigate it. First, $20 million from the City of San Antonio in the form of ARPA, America Rescue Plan Act funding. We are in the midst of utilizing those funds, focusing on residential customers only. While these ARPA funds have a meaningful effect on our customers most in need, they don't have a major impact on the big picture financially. Second, we have been assured for months and months that the customer bad debt figure would be substantially reduced upon resumption of disconnections of our residential customers. When I inquired months ago during our rate increase effort, you consistently said that we would have a good idea of the financial impact of those unpaid debts by March or, or the latest April. So here we are on, on June 27th, and I'm still respectfully waiting for a clearer picture of the financial repercussions of this customer debt. And why is this important? Well, let's focus on the three key financial metrics that the credit rating agency is closely monitoring, starting with day's cash on hand. The fiscal year 2023 Tier 1 metric report you sent me last Friday illustrates how concerning this issue is. Obviously, the higher the day's cash on hand number, the better, but it is a red flag if the number drops below 150 days. The last two fiscal years, it has been well above 150. It was, it was 209 for fiscal year 2021 and 182 for fiscal year 2022, but as of May 31, 2022, the number is 124. Furthermore, in regard to the second critical metric, debt service co coverage, there is also concern it is a red flag if the ratio drops below 1.5. Our last two fiscal years, it has been above that threshold. It was 1.59 for fiscal year 2021 and 1.66 for fiscal year 2022. But as of May 31, 2022, that number is 1.45. The last of the three key financial metrics is the debt to capital ratio. I wasn't provided that number, but we have been told that CPA. CPS Energy will not meet that threshold of less than 60 percent by the end of the fiscal year. Uh, this is a metric where the lower it is, the better, and CPS Energy is planning not to meet this met metric by budgeting at 61.66 percent. So in terms of how we are viewed by the rating agencies, at this point we are currently coming up short on each of the three key financial metrics. And this is happening in an environment where we have already been downgraded by the big three. That's Fitch, Moody's, and S&P, and two of the three have proclaimed our outlook is negative, while the other pegs us as stable when the highest rating is positive. Mr. Garza, earlier in the year I asked you why you had eliminated a regular financial presentation from our board agendas. You responded by agreeing to a financial presentation at every third meeting, but we should be addressing this at every board meeting. I will note, too, that back during our rate increased discussions, this debt, now totaling $160 million and rising, was not considered to be a, quote, immediate financial pressure, close quote, and so was not factored into our rate increase request. I said it then, and I repeat, that was a mistake. Further, the delay and tentativeness in reinstating disconnections have been and are sending mixed signals to our customers. Sure, we have got customers, certain customers who are struggling, and of course we need to be mindful of that. But I think our messaging has also been telling our broad customer base, in effect, you need not prioritize paying your CPS energy bill. The communications surrounding this issue have been handled by the way the communications surrounding this issue have been handled by the company leaves much to be desired. 
For an outstanding article that lays out the dimensions of this problem, I refer you to Diego Mendoza Moyer's May 31, 2022 article in the Express News, where he characterized total past due bills as, quote, soaring, close quote. We had the chance to ease the pressure on our customers by pausing the STEP program, which was a 10-year program that staff announced had reached its goal two years ago. Because STEP represents an average of 3 to 4.5 percent of the customer's bill, suspending the program would have, for many customers, negated the 3.85 percent rate increase implemented March 1st. Yes, there would have been a lag, but this would have happened. All this amounts to a business-as-usual approach to CPS Energy Matters when, as a company, and when we as a company and so many of our customers are facing significant financial challenges. To get a really good sense of how our customers are being weighed down, I direct each of you to an article by Timothy Fanning, assisted by Shelby Webb, that appeared a week ago in the San Antonio Express News. That's the June 20th, 2022 edition. The reader is introduced to CPS Energy customer Sarah Belsick, whose monthly electric bill for the 1,100-square-foot home near Leon Valley where she lives with her three-year-old daughter has increased from $140 to $253. Combined with inflation and other factors driving up the cost of living, this single mom is worried, struggling to stay afloat, and is being forced to look for a second job. Yes, there are things we can't control, like record heat. Throughout May and continuing through today, we're experiencing daily temperatures over 100 degrees when our city typically doesn't experience its first triple-digit day until July. In regard to the surging price of natural gas, which has contributed significantly to our customers' bill shock, a recent presentation by our CFO, Corey Kajinski, indicates we're doing what we can to protect our customers, including employing strategic financial hedging, utilizing our prepaid long-term natural gas arrangement, increasing natural gas storage and baseline gas purchases, and generally taking advantage of our diversified fuel strategy but we're falling short on things we can control, such as the failure to pause step. So let me attempt to bring all this together, pull it all together, because there's a thread that connects a series of questionable actions. We have a crisis in that today roughly 20 percent of our customers are at least 30 days past due on their CPS energy payments. We were told numerous times at the end of last year and throughout the first half of this year that this financial problem would be quantified and well under control by now, but I believe it isn't. At the same time, CPS Energy is not doing nearly enough to reduce customer bills. We had the opportunity to do so by pausing the STEP program, but failed to do so even when a pause was supported by a plurality of our rate advisory committee. So, Mr. Garza, I'm pulling for you to get on top of these problems, but I'm not encouraged by what I see. In closing, I request that this statement be included in full in the minutes of today's meeting. Thank you. Okay. Anything you'd like to share? Uh no, you have nothing else. Okay. Any other question? Any other board members have any comments, or questions, or concerns? Yes. Um, just a quick comment, and it's it's really minor, but I'm struggling a little bit with these tables, and I just want to. Can you get a little? Sorry to interrupt. Can you get a little closer? Your mic is not picking up. Um, I'm struggling a little bit with the data visualization in these tables, and, and I'd be happy to talk with you about that at some point. It's these tables. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Some of them are really clear and some of them are less clear. And I, I'm spending a lot of time with them. And if this is something we'll be sharing with the public, I just wonder if they could just be a little more reader friendly. Okay. I'd be happy to talk about that with you. I'll get with you. After. All right. Thank you. Any other board members? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Ms. Uh, Ramirez, would you please take us into uh, executive session? Yes, sir. At this time, the board is going to recess into an executive session to discuss matters that have been duly posted under several provisions of Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, including consultation concerning attorney-client matters under Section 551.071, deliberations and other authorization on real property under Section 551.072, prospective gifts or donations under Section 551.073, personnel matters under Section 551.074, Security personnel or devices under Section 551.076, to deliberate regarding security audits and devices under Section 551.089, to deliberate under Texas Government Code Section 418.183, subsection F, about confidential information under the Texas Homeland Security Act, economic development negotiations under Section 551.076, and to deliberate, vote, or take final action on competitive matters 
under Section 551.086. At the conclusion of executive session, the board will reconvene in open session, continue the meeting. It is 1.39 p.m. as we go into executive session. Thank you.
Thank you.
Thank you. 
Thank you.
Ms. Ramirez, would you please bring us back in open session? Yes, sir. It is 2.50 p.m. and the board has concluded executive session. I can confirm that there were no votes taken and no matters were discussed that were not part of the posted agenda. We do have a quorum. All members are present. Thank you. At this time, we'll move to item number eight, approval of consent items. Uh, the minutes A, the minutes of regular board meeting held on 4-25-22. B, uh, minutes of regular board meeting held on 5-23-22. And C, payment to the City of San Antonio for May 2022. We have a motion uh, moved by uh, Mr. Trustee Steen. We, do we have a second? Second. Second by Trustee Romero. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all. And if we could move to item number nine, uh, committee reports, Operation Oversight Committee meeting held on 413 22. Uh, that's a uh, Trustee Romero, uh, B, Personnel Committee meeting held on 412, 522, Trustee Gonzalez, C, Audit and Finance Committee held on 511, 22, Trustee Steen, D, Employee Benefits Oversight Committee meeting held on 511, 2022, by Trustee Steen. Do we have a move to uh, put this in the minutes? So moved. We move by Trustee Romero. Do we have a second? Second, Trustee Gonzalez. Trustee Gonzalez. Okay, we'll put them, put them in the uh, minutes. There's no vote on that. Okay, we'll move to uh, item number 10, generation planning update by Mr. Mr. Kevin Polo. So good afternoon, trustees. I'm happy to be here today to talk about our generation planning activities for, for the upcoming summer. Uh, we'll start and uh, give a high level timeline uh, of the activities we have planned for the year and finish with a, an update on the project. Um, I do think as we look at uh, what's shown at the bottom of the slide and we talk about near term transition, we're really focused as we walk through our generation planning activities this summer on the steps that we have to take between now and, and 2030. Uh, we have a, a, several units we have to make decisions on, and really the three key things are, are listed at the bottom of, of that slide. You know, what we have to address is retirement of our aging gas steam units, replacement of our coal-fired units, and also additional capacity to cover uh, our peak load growth. We do project, uh, as we're blessed to have a growing community, but that means uh, more folks moving to San Antonio uh, and more load for us to serve. Uh, this slide just shows, again, a high-level uh, timeline of, of kind of where we've been over the last few months and where we expect to go. You know, we really started uh, late last year, September 2021, uh, engaged the Rate Advisory Committee with an introduction into our generation planning process. And we've been meeting with them uh, pretty much every month, um, certainly this year, uh, through the first part of this year. Uh, as we went through the rate request approval process, and we did not include capital for new generation in that plan, but instead we committed to come back to the board and provide a recommendation on you know, the future of our generation fleet by the end of this year, by December. Uh, and so the activities that you see on this slide, you know, talking about scenarios, analysis approach, uh, the analysis results, that's all the detailed activities, the detailed modeling that we'll be working on uh, over the next several months, all building towards uh, providing uh, you with a recommendation in December uh, of where we should go with our transition. I do also want to highlight, we've added on this slide, um, in May, the, the announcement of our 300 megawatt solar project that is the, the first step uh, in our generation fleet transition, but uh, certainly was a highlight for us as we uh, continue to work through uh, wrapping up the Flex Power Bundle project. Now, this slide, again, shows our, our port generation portfolio as of today. You know, the focus of our near-term transition is going to be, again, on those three groups of power plants that are off to the right, highlighted in the gold color. Um, you know, the, the Spruce, Summers, Braunig units. Uh, I do think it's important to point out, you know, as we remain very optimistic and very encouraged by the potential for new technologies to be integrated into our, our fleet as we work through the transition. But I also think we need to be mindful of the fact that, you know, some of the existing technologies uh, also will help enable that transition uh, and integration of newer
technologies, but also uh, helping us to maintain you know, reliable energy uh, that we can provide to our community at a competitive price. So all those different factors are going to be uh, looked at here as we walk through our, our generation planning process. Uh, this slide, we did show this at the, at the Risk Management Committee meeting last month, but I wanted to bring it back because I, I do think it's a, it's a good graphic to show a potential sequence of transition, obviously subject to, to board approval uh, you know, as we work through the, the recommendation. Uh, but again, this shows the, the three groups of plants that I mentioned, the Browning units, Summers, and, and Spruce. Uh, you know, ultimately, we're looking at about 3,000 megawatts of, of generation that were, will be impacted you know, by the end of the decade. Uh, I also think uh, you know, we, we have the, uh, the little trophy, if you will, by 2050. But as we work through the, even the near-term transition, it's important to note that you know, achievement of our cap goals will be a driving factor on the decisions that we make now you know, with this near-term transition. And certainly will continue to be part of the discussion as we work through you know, the longer-term plan to go not only from today to 2030, but from today to 2050. We've talked a lot in recent meetings about you know, the need to, to replace retiring capacity. What we haven't talked so much about is, is peak demand. I mentioned earlier we, we are blessed as a growing community, uh, but what that means is, you know, is we, we are projecting to have increased load growth. So on this slide, to, to the left we show our historical load growth, and to the right we show our, our forecasted growth. And, but we're looking at about 95 megawatts of, of incremental growth or incremental peak demand every year. So between now and 2030, that's about 760 megawatts of, of new load that we have to serve, uh, roughly the size of our Rio Nogales combined cycle power plant. Uh, this view shows, starts with uh, the, the pie chart labeled as 2021. That's the, the makeup of our, our fuel mix today. Uh, and the other two graphs show you know, some progression and potential looks at the future. So. The one in the middle labeled 2025 uh, shows what our fuel mix will look like uh, after we complete flex power bundle. So that's the addition of the 900 megawatts of solar, 50 megawatts of storage, and the 500 megawatts of, of gas-fired firming capacity, and also shows the retirement of the three Brauna gas steam units. As you look at 2030, you look at the, the key assumptions, assuming we retire Summers 1, Summers 2, Spruce 1, um, you know, then we have, uh, and, and the additional load growth, that kind of makes up the, the pink slice, if you will, that's labeled as needed. Uh, so roughly about a you know, quarter of the generation that we're going to need by the end of the decade, we need to make decisions on what that will look like. Uh, the, the gray pie slice labeled as Spruce 2, again, we have decisions there about either potentially retiring Spruce 2 uh, or converting it to natural gas. But I think as you look at that slide, you know, the, the, the pink slice and the gray slice, ultimately as we make decisions through this process, you know, I expect that those will either get uh, absorbed into the, the purple uh, renewable slice or in some of it in the green uh, gas-fired. Uh, but that's a potential look of our, at our fleet here about you know, eight years from now at the end of the decade. Uh, this graph uh, shows all of our non-renewable generating units, but uh, graphically again shows a similar sequence, you know, looking at potential retirement dates. Uh, you know, we show the three Browning units uh, retiring first, uh, followed by Summers 1, um, Spruce 2, uh, in terms of a potential gas conversion. That's the, the gray slice that you see on the slide. Uh, potentially would come next, and then, and then Spruce 1 retirement. Um, and then right about that same time as Spruce 1 would be the Summers 2 retirement. So another way to look at this is the white space that we're showing on this chart is the generation capacity that we need to replace. Uh, so again, when you look at that white space along with the load growth I mentioned on the earlier slide, again, about 3,000 megawatts of new generation is going to be required to continue to meet our customer needs by the end of the decade. As we look at, at the modeling process and, and really the generation planning process that we'll go through this summer, this slide is, is meant to show kind of our, our proposed starting point. So we look at uh, the possible retirements. Again, it lists the, the same plants I've mentioned on the earlier slides, but gives you know, some potential dates uh, as far as retirements. When you look at the planned additions, again, the, the solar storage firming, that's the flex power bundle, which is in flight, in progress. And then the other four line items, Summers 1 replacements, Spruce 1, Summers 2 replacements, and then the load growth capacity. So the generation planning process that we'll go through this summer will decide you know, what the resource mix will be to replace those four line items that are highlighted in gray. 
Uh, so it's important, I think, also, as we continue to work with the Rate Advisory Committee, the Citizens Advisory Committee, and other community stakeholders, you know, we're seeking feedback on these different scenarios, uh, and we'll, we plan to model all the different scenarios that are, are of interest to our stakeholders to ultimately help uh, educate the recommendations that we'll bring you by the end of the year. Uh, so that concludes uh, my presentation, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Mr. Polo, are, are you, this was just put in front of me, but are you familiar with this RMI, which is the Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, December 10th, 2021, Technical Review of CPS Energy's 2021 Flexible Path Resource Plan? Yes, sir. We've been uh, looking at that here recently. And I think uh, that it was attached to an email that I received over the weekend, but that was the first time I've seen it. And, and, and I just I would ask the question, why are we just now seeing this report, which, of course, is dated December 10th, 2021? So, so Mr. Steen, let me, let me jump in here. Number one, that is a, you know, that wasn't a, a CPS Energy commissioned report. That was an independent report that was performed by a third party on the, uh, on the uh, resource plan information that we put out, I don't know, a couple of years ago now. Uh, that has been that's dated quite frankly uh, I only saw that report a couple weeks ago I've got my team doing some analysis of what it says um, so you know again our staff just you know kind of got wind of it and now we're, we're starting to take a look at it and just two more questions um, how would CPS energy address the best practices highlighted in the report we we haven't we haven't come up with any of that, sir. We we got to take a look at the report and and uh, let you know what our opinion is of what's an independent report. All right. And then the third question: How would CPS Energy address the recommendation to embrace all source procurements? Same same answer, sir. I mean, we'll we'll come back with an opinion of what that report says. We're not prepared to do that today. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. <sighs> Kind of on the same topic. So I spent a lot of time this morning um, reading the RMI report. Sorry, UTSA wasn't working. Um, so yeah, I, I think you, you already said some of the things I thought because um, when they were addressing the flexible path resource plan, and then I went back and looked at that and I found a presentation from early in 21, and it did seem really preliminary. I mean, it didn't have scenarios. Um, it was just sort of getting out some basic information about these are the things we want to do. It, it did talk about CAP. I, you know, talked about closing the, the coal plants. Um, so it was very preliminary. And I, and I do think um, some of this is, is, the report is preliminary too, because nobody ever presented that as these are the scenarios because it wasn't the time yet, correct? Dr. Romero, that, that's right. You know, again, we were trying to put information out there to begin a community conversation about uh, the future. Since that time, the board has given us, you know, kind of a pathway to have a community dialogue about this, and that pathway flows through the RAC. So the RAC has seen and will continue to see updated and much more detailed information about where we are today and where we think we're going. And so uh, that resource plan, again, was a was a, an, a very initial attempt to provide much more detailed uh, information than we had ever pro provided the community before uh, on, you know, our, our overall kind of generation, you know, resource planning process. So um, it's going to, you know, I, I mean, I think what you'll see when we do respond to it will be that the information's dated and here's kind of where we are, you know, in that process. Um, so again, you know, we will hand that, what, what we do intend to do is as we begin the process of uh, engaging with our modeling uh, company, we will hand that report to the modeling company and make sure that they take, you know, the, those perspectives into account as they will, you know, what the RAC has to say and anybody else, quite frankly, who comes to us uh, with, with feedback, including staff's own feedback. You know, uh, I have in my head what the process is going to look like for the decisions that the board will make on these issues uh, and you know and 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 we'll talk to the board about what that looks like but but again our resource plan was is is two years old and things have changed you know pretty significantly in that two years okay and I guess I would just say um, I don't think it's fair to 
to call staff on the carpet and and say, why have you not responded to this report? There could be all kinds of reports out there. Um, you did not commission this report. There's there's no reason for that. At the same time, uh, there's I think when you read it over, I don't think there's any big bombshells in it so much. I mean, they're saying things like, in your scenarios, you need to include pricing information and growth of the city information and climate information. And, and I've heard all those things. So mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is I, I would hope that staff isn't asked to, to devote a whole lot of time to specifically responding to a report that, that this company never commissioned. Um, and I, I do think it's, it's pretty basic stuff that I have heard you all talk about. Um, I guess I just want to want to ask you this um, in terms of scenarios so I know we're going to have an outside consultant and different people have different ideas but if when we move forward and you're presenting different scenarios to us about how to fill in that pink slice of the pie how many would you think is is reasonable or would you have like main scenarios and then it's broken down into into smaller ones i think we're going to try to run as many scenarios as, as we get uh, input on um, you know i think we look at uh, the three i'd say main you know options that we've talked with the rate advisory committee about so far in, in terms of that pink slice would be uh, looking at an all renewable option where that slice is replaced by a combination of wind solar uh, and storage uh, geothermal maybe also fit potentially in that, that category. I think the second uh, item or, or main option would be looking at replacing it with an all-gas solution. So again, a combination of combined cycle units and, and peaking type units. Uh, we've referred to, I think, in this meeting at different times, reciprocating internal combustion engines or rice units. Those are uh, uh, kind of where the peaking generation is, is heading in a way. That, uh, and I think the third uh, main option we're looking at would be what we call a blended approach. So it'd look a lot probably like the portfolio we have today where we'd fill that pink slot with a combination of renewables and then a combination of gas fired, if you will, to, to fill in and provide that firming capacity. So I think those are kind of the three main uh, offshoots or, or options. And then you've got a number of different ways or, or iterations within each of those. And I think We'll look at as many of those iterations as, as you know the community wants us to look at. Okay, and just one more question. Sorry, and I know this might seem kind of obvious, but and I know that you don't get to make the final decision on which scenario we go with. But as we ask you for a recommendation on different scenarios, what guides you on that? So, in other words, you're looking for the scenario that best meets what values. Yeah, so Dr. Romero, what, uh, what the staff is committed to and what we've been clear with the community about is uh, our recommendation has to meet the level of reliability and affordability that our community expects kind of as a gate, right? You got to get through those two gates first. Does it meet the needs of the community and, is, and is, does it keep us affordable as compared to the Texas market? And then, you know, all the other you know, variables that factor into that. In my mind, I think there is a percentage of renewables that allows us to do one and two uh, appropriately. And so I think, you know, the question we'll ask the board is, you know, based on the financial analysis, analyses that we run, you know, we think X percent of renewables is achievable by some date. Um, we think that you need some, some amount of dispatchable uh, generation and here are the different technologies we think we can achieve to get there. Uh, and so there'll be a percentage of renewables, a percentage of dispatchable, and then some percentage that I believe we can that we that will help meet our goals through demand response and batteries and other ways to, to manage the peak. Right? If we can manage the peak at some level that allows us to make sound investments in the other two, which quite frankly is why step is so important to the equation, then that can be a number that also factors in to reliability and affordability as well. Um, so in my mind, it'll be, you know, here's the mix that, that we recommend keeps us where we need to be and achieves the goals of CAP and all the other things that the community expects out of us. Um, so, so that's how I see a recommendation coming back to the board. 
with a whole lot of input from the community. Okay, thank you. And I really appreciate that. And I knew it was sort of obvious, but everything I've seen, um, there's there's just been a lot of consistency from staff in in fealty to those pr underlying principles of of what we want to achieve. And I just want to I just want to say that because I go to a lot of RAC meetings, and I appreciate that you've always been consistent with that. Just a comment. I'm I'm aligned with you, Mr. Garza, on that. The idea that we look at affordability and reliability. And I like the way that you characterize that as a gate. And so I'm, I just wanted you to know I'm in agreement with that. I'll just um, take a moment to re-articulate what we said when we first got the flex uh, resource plan. The resource plan itself was meant to be a living document. So we, we are hopefully going to receive some updates to that, uh, as well as uh, considering the analysis and and uh, deliberations of the RAC, which one of the two pillars that they were created for was to provide guidance on rate design as well as on generation planning. So the need for that kind of um, deliberation on the resource plan is, is sort of the reason why they exist. Um, that RMI analysis was on no new data. It's all based on that resource plan. Now, now it's one of the deliverables of the American Cl Cities Climate Challenge. And all of this deliberation, again, is to ensure that we're reaching our reliability affordability challenges, but also to meet the uh, overall community goal of, of the CAP goals in 2050. So hopefully all of this is re aligning, but no one should have any uh, predisposition that the resource plan that we have today is the one that will exist forevermore. It's going to change. Thank you. I'll move. Uh, we have mayor motion, uh, move to adjourn. Do we have a second? Second. Second.